everybody uh, to your post-lunch nap session. No, I'm sorry, a panel on the role of subsidies in LPG distribution or clean fuels distribution more generally. Um, my name is Darby Jack. I'm a faculty member at, at Columbia University, and we're joined by an absolutely stellar panel of, of, of experts uh, and, and thinkers in, in clean fuel distribution. Um, so we're joined by Mr. Abbas Tasunti, who is the pricing head at the National Petroleum Authority here in Ghana. We're joined by uh, Jan Klon, who is the coordinating energizing development director uh, or part of the team at the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Um, Mr. Martin Kamani, who's the managing director at IMGAS in Kenya. And Ms. Juliette Pampuni, who's a senior energy specialist with the World Bank. Um, so I think you'll agree this is a very a excellent panel. Um, so just a, a brief note on how we're going to run things. Um, I'm just going to give a couple of orienting remarks. And then we're going to have a debate, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we're going to have some questions uh, and uh, that will be sort of posed by me and discussed by the panel. And then we'll open it up to, to questions from the, from the audience. Um, so, so by way of framing, uh, I want to sort of start off with, with, with a couple of things that I think are true. The first is that absent subsidies, hundreds of millions of people at the bottom of the pyramid will continue to use polluting fuels for generations. And sort of a, a, a point there is that in terms of health that you get what you pay for. The lowest cost stoves may not deliver large health benefits. And this makes the, the problem of supplying high quality uh, clean cooking to the bottom of the pyramid even harder. And then a second thing that is true is that subsidies are costly and may have significant unintended consequences. And we'll be, we'll be hearing about some of those. Um, and I want to put forward the example of the country of Ecuador as sort of an anchor on one end of the spectrum. And Ecuador, uh, a 14.5 kilo cylinder of, of LPG in Ecuador costs uh, $1.60. And it's cost that since 2001. And LPG has essentially displaced biomass as a cooking fuel. Essentially, to a first approximation, nobody in, LP, in, in Ecuador uh, cooks with LPG. But the government spends about 1% of GDP, about $700 million a year, on this subsidy. So this sort of exemplifies the opportunity, but also the, the potential cost of subsidies. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the, some of the ways that, that maybe they could have improved on their system. Um, and then on the other hand, you have a country like Ghana, which has a cost recovery model for pricing, and the full cost plus some, some, some margin for the LPG marketing companies are, are paid by the consumer. So these sort of anchor the two, the two extremes. And then I think what we perhaps want to end up with is exploring potential space in the middle. Um, so we're, gonna, we're going to frame this as a debate to start off for about the first 20 minutes. And I want to really underscore that the panelists were assigned their roles in the debate. And the, the, the points they're going to be making may not represent their own personal views, nor certainly the views of their institutions. But we, we decided to structure it this way to sort of get the, get the, get the arguments on the table and, and, then, and then take a step back and, and, and think about, about sort of where, where, the, where the middle ground might be. Um, and the proposition that, that, uh, that, that people will be responding to, that the panelists will be responding to, is that, uh, that free provision of stoves and fuels does more harm than good. Um, and so uh, the, the, the anti-subsidy uh, position will be taken by um, my Juliet and, and, and Jans, and the pro-subsidy uh, position will be taken by Abbas and Martin. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to Juliet to get us started. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As Davi mentioned, my partner Jan and I will be making the argument against subsidies. Let's face it, everybody loves cheap energy. And almost all human activity requires energy consumption. And if something is so basic, it is pretty obvious that it should not be denied to everyone. And governments make it cheap so that everybody can benefit from it. However, I would argue that subsidies 
are not really a good way of achieving what governments say they want to do. Sometimes it goes to companies who might not make them, help them be competitive. Other times, you know, it goes to the wrong uh, consumer. So subsidies, you know, are really, really not the way to go. But for, the, for today, I'm going to focus on two interlinked reasons why subsidies are bad. First, subsidized clean cooking products reduce the willingness to pay and distort markets or prevent markets from emerging. And I will go down and try to buttress the, this point. When stoves are given for free or for a nominal fee without considering the household's ability to pay or what they are willing to pay for it, it erroneously sends signals to consumers that the value of the product is lower than the commercial price. And hence, it depresses the market and deprives suppliers or producers from having a healthy and strong business. Sometimes and most of the times, the subsidy uh, design is ineffective and inaccurate because the measurement of the affordability gap is really done wrong. That's a difficult thing and it helps, you know, uh, that is some, a real component that helps to design the subsidy, but then we do get it wrong. And this also leads to market distortion. This is mainly due to lack of data. Data to calculate the affordability gap, as I said, or household categories to certain the inefficient levels of the subsidies. Therefore, you know, to get this done, you need some rigorous analysis, which, like I said, in most developing countries is difficult to do. You don't have the data, you don't have the right methodologies to calculate the subsidy. As, and it's been noted that successful and unsuccessful subsidies are based on the end user subsidy program being influenced by com, uh, consumers' affordability estimates. Many of times, government gets it wrong, and then the private sector gets the wrong signal, and they are not willing to invest in the sector. There's also a lack of uh, clarity for commercial market players in the expansion and support planning if the subsidy scheme does not have a clear exit strategy. So they are unable to plan for their commercial operations and uh, around the scheme. Uh, following this point, uh, once the subsidy is in place, most of the time it's difficult to stop it. Governments, you know, the, the, the consumers do not know what is going on in the world. Well, prices of things keep on going up, but they are, they are not aware of it, so they do not expect the price to change. So definitely when the subsidy is removed, the politicians get into trouble for, you know, not maintaining the price. The second point against subsidy is that if the purpose of the subsidy isn't communicated, all it does is to reduce the user's perception of what the product is worth and limits the degree to which they are used. Uh, I was uh, describing a couple of uh, instances to my colleagues here. When people do not value the uh, commodity, they do not use it well. They are also, you know, they, they do not use it because they do not understand the benefit. That needs to communicate to them clearly. Also, some other people who did not benefit from the subsidy would wait to see you know, to get the subsidy because they do not think that what they are paying for is the commercially correct price. So that is something that also spoils the market as well. Uh, when subsidies are given and people don't have a worth, they do not have a skin in the game, they do not value, they do not use it well, they do not get the benefits and they do not engage well in the market. But I will stop here. My colleague, Jan, will continue. I know of a case where Free stoves were given, and people, after the fuel got dispersed, they used them as flower pots or some decorative pieces without getting the full benefit of the subsidy. So here's my case for the subsidies not being the best way to, uh, to keep, uh, to supply stoves. So my colleague, Jan, will continue with this important yeah. point. But first, we'll pass the voice to Abbas. Okay. Um, 
we've all heard from Juliet why subsidies are not good. Um, but um, I believe we've all gathered here to make a case. And the case is to, we've all gathered here to um, try and achieve an objective, which is to promote clean cooking. Um, why are we talking about clean cooking when uh, we know that the fuels and the accessories that are needed to achieve clean cooking are relatively more expensive than the current um, methods of cooking today. There are income inequalities in the system as we speak. And as long as there are income inequalities, willingness to pay, as she said, will definitely vary. So if we are to achieve um, clean cooking and the cost of uh, getting the fuel, the cost of getting the accessories cannot be afforded by all, then how are we going to achieve this objective of clean cooking? So I would want to share some um, data and some examples to show why, how subsidies have helped to achieve uh, clean cooking in some other countries. First of all, um, if you look at Ghana, for example, um, LPG consumed in Ghana between January and June this year, 50% of that LPG, which is a clean, way of, a clean fuel for cooking, was consumed just in the greater Accra and Ashanti regions, which are urban areas where income levels are quite high. If you take all the five regions in the northern sector of the country together, they consume just 7% of LPG consumed in Ghana. And these are the areas where non-clean cooking methods are very high. So if we are to achieve clean cooking, how do we support these people to increase um, their use of clean cooking materials like cook stoves and LPG, which is the cleanup method of cooking? So there's really a case for subsidies. Um, in Ghana, subsidies were scrapped because, just as she said, they are expensive. But we need to find a way to get them well targeted, then we can make sure that we are achieving our, uh, our um, clean cooking. Let's take, uh, take countries that have been able to use subsidies, for example, to achieve clean cooking. India is an example. They were, they've been able to use subsidies to achieve clean cooking. Um, if you look at El Salvador, Thailand, Peru, these are all countries that have used subsidies to achieve the promotion of clean cooking. So we cannot ignore um, subsidies and say that because they are expensive, therefore we should, uh, we should not uh, target people and subsidize uh, fuels and clean cooking accessories for them. There are definitely challenges with subsidies when they are not well targeted. But I believe that these challenges that we face with subsidies are not unsurmountable. We can overcome these challenges when we have accurate data, we have technologies that will help us to collect, collect correct data on, uh, on consumers and then know who is well deserving of this subsidy and target them and give the subsidies to them. If we should ignore them, what happens is that people who, you go, who are involved with non-clean cooking, they end up getting sick, government comes back, spends so much money on trying to subsidize health, health care for them. So if the government decides to ignore um, subsidizing clean cooking accessories and fuels for consumers, it comes back to bite government. And therefore, it's, there's an opportunity cost to, to not doing this. So my case here is that subsidies have a role to play. If we are able to target the consumers who need it very well, we will be able to achieve our objective of clean cooking. Thank you very much. But, but my dear colleague, Vas, you got it all wrong. <laughs> you got it all wrong because blanket subsidies, it's so easy to introduce and you, you can easily say as a politician, we are going to subsidize all kerosene use in the country. And you can see what happened in the, in the past decades. Kerosene was used in buses, in cars, blended with diesel, just because they were the cheapest way to go. A lot of uh, kerosene was wasted because the price was artificially low. There, <clears throat> there was no incentive for energy efficiency, but rather there was uh, a, a, uh, uh, it was a source uh, of, of loss for the government uh, that could have raised revenue for, uh, for uh, the, uh, the, the f fossil fuel usage. Also, these blanket subsidies, they would lead to a lot of leakage. They would get to the first, they would first get to the, to the urban middle class uh, and they would get access to these fuels. Uh, that's exactly what's happening with LPG. But these subsidies were actually meant to displace Fuel, uh, fuel wood and firewood in the uh, rural areas and these subsidies would never get there. These distribution chains do not exist that would get these uh, fuels out there. That we, so this, this was obviously uh, uh, part of the, the policy objective. So um, this type of loss will also uh, be present, for example, 
if you look at spillage across borders, if Ghana suddenly decides to, uh, to subsidize LPG, uh, what would happen? A lot of these, these cylinders would go all over the place because they are suddenly very, very cheap. And so um, I think it's, it's a big mistake, right? And then uh, uh, the other point is that to phase out these subsidies is actually also very, very difficult. Uh, no government uh, would like to have uh, their name under the phasing out of this subsidy. They, uh, they would have to do this for, the, for eternity or uh, else uh, cause riots. And so this, this is really, really difficult uh, and, and bad idea. So uh, another point which my colleague Juliet made, uh, um, uh, and I would like to emphasize that a minimum price for the equipment and a minimum price for the energy services that you are using is important for the uh, perception of value. And, and so if we start to subsidize things, uh, I've heard of, of uh, programs where LPG is almost given away for free, uh, LPG equipment is given away. Um, people indeed uh, can use this for all sorts of things. I heard of uh, LPG uh, s um, tanks that were used as uh, benches, as uh, flower pots, as, as uh, various accessories because they have no value, whereas in the real world they actually are very valuable. And so. Um, the big mistake that, uh, that governments can make is to, to provide these, these subsidies uh, in, 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 a, in a large scale and uh, cost a lot of money, have a lot of spillage, and do not lead to the objective where they were, um, where they were meant for. So I'd say, bad idea. Um, if you do it, it must be extremely well targeted, and it must, um, you must make sure with your policy implementation it, it somehow reaches the customers that we were all doing this for in the first place. That's why I'm against. Good afternoon. I think uh, my colleagues are not very right, especially Jan. <laughs> <laughs> because one thing that we will all agree, and Jan will also agree with me, is that the rate of penetration for clean cooking is extremely low. And this is especially in the developing countries. This can be seen, and we all know that, and that is why we are champions of clean cooking. And we can give examples, examples for countries that we know. And what is even more important to understand is that the effect, the health effect, the negative effect of the alternatives that are that year and easy to access are quite more damaging. I don't want to go into the details because I know these topics have been covered in this uh, forum uh, quite a bit, but we know that we are losing lives. If I give an example of the country that I come from, which is Kenya, we are losing over 20,000 lives every year. And this turns into the millions if you look at the continent. So the effect uh, or the negative effect in terms of health, in terms of uh, our environment are very clear to all of us. And why is it uh, the case? It's because alternatives are easy to access for most of the populations, for most of the households. They are cheap, they are easily accessible, and that is why most populations or most households go for that. And for us to push that or to change that bad situation, I therefore say that we cannot avoid going the subsidy way. We cannot avoid discussing, implementing, and thinking through ways of subsidizing, ways of assisting uh, those households who, when left without that, will be condemned for generations to endure dirty fuels and to continue experiencing a negative health impact. And even, again, as a, as a continent, as a planet, we, we all know about the climate effect uh, to that effect. So, subsidies, I must uh, submit to all of us, are key. I think it's a question of how, how do we go about this? Again, if I give an example of my country, we have 24% penetration rate of using LPG, which is a cleaner fuel. This is 24% uh, across the country, and if you split the country into two, which is urban and rural, you will even realize the effect of us in rural, uh, uh, in rural parts, where below 6% only, uh, use or have access to uh, clean cooking. Why is this the case? The case is so because 
most families or most households, most communities cannot be able to raise the upfront acquisition costs for the equipment. And even further, uh, the, 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 the ability to pay for the fuel itself. And this is why I say that for us to be able to cause an impact, for us to be able to push uh, uh, clean cooking a, a little bit uh, faster, we must introduce subsidies. Because in my case, again, for the 24% penetration, uh, for, for, for us to achieve, that as, to achieve that as a country, it took us decades. So it takes six, seven decades to achieve only 24%. We have invested as a country, government, private sector, in a lot of um, enhancement of the supply chain. So this is no longer a problem. Supply chain has been well enhanced. We are able to get cleaner fuels into the country. But I feel and I believe this has hit the limit. For us now to be able to go to the next level, we must be able to empower the households because we have built infrastructure, but the households still cannot, uh, cannot afford. So we need to go to them, we need to think through, we need not only to subsidize the equipment or the accessories, because if you stop there, I would uh, agree with Jan that then this equipment can be used as, as furniture. So you need to go ahead and help them to be able to use the clean fuels themselves. If I give an example with my own organization, and I say this because there are two tools that can be used today to make subsidies a reality. And this is the tool of technology, which is readily available, and the tool of data, which we can access. If I talk about uh, technology, today it's very possible to meet a gas. My organization has gotten, gone into producing smart meters that we are giving to households together with the cylinders and cooking stoves, all for free, and enable them, which enables them then to pay in small bits on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, this helps them to use LPG every day, just the same way they would spend a dollar or less to buy charcoal or to buy paraffin. In this case, they spend less of that money on a daily basis, but in this case, to achieve LPG in small bits. In the last uh, uh, three years of our existence, including piloting phase and, uh, and a proof of concept, we have been able to onboard more than 300,000 households. In a record three years, we have been able to push the penetration of LPG in Kenya by above 2%. That is quite quick, and only time will tell how more, how much more we can be able to do if we continue with the same concept. So I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that we must go the subsidy way if we are to help households move into clean cooking. Thank you. <laughs> Good round of well, that, now I understand why they wanted me to sit in the middle to keep the peace. <laughs> so, you know, for those of you who joined late, this debate was a bit artificial. Um, we asked the, the, the panelists to, to take on positions that may not be their own positions and certainly not the positions of their institutions. And what I'd like to do now is sort of break the role play and, and ask, ask each of them to, to sort of reflect on, on what they heard in the debate and, and maybe state some of their, their own uh, beliefs. And, and there may be instances where the, what, they, what they were so articulate in saying just now totally aligns with their beliefs. But, but you know, to sort of break the, break the role play and, 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 and say their reflections on, on the conversation just now. So maybe we'll start with Juliet. So I guess I'm back to my real, <laughs> to my real body. Yes, uh, well, subsidies are really, really, you know, in one, on one hand, you can say they are a no-brainer. You want people to have access to clean energy uh, solutions. So the way to do that is to give them subsidies. But many a time, we, or it's difficult for our clients to be able to calculate the subsidy properly so that they are able to make sure that it gets to the people who really deserve it, the people who really need it, because they are the ones who are going to benefit. And when we even give them the uh, clean cook stove, the next step is to be able to quantify what they got out of it, what the benefits were, health benefits, women don't have to go walk miles to get some charcoal, and, uh, you know, there, there are so many benefits that many at times, maybe politicians don't think about that, but it's like, you know, the initial satisfaction of giving uh, consumers something that they want them to use. Right now, there might not be things coming up for 
agree some of them are highly subsidized. But with these carbon funds around, really uh, stoves are being given away for free. Is that a sustainable model? That is something that we can discuss going forward in the panel or amongst the uh, participants here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Abbas, I'd, I'd be curious to hear both your personal views, but also how your institution, the NPA, the National Petroleum Authority here in Ghana, is, is thinking about this question. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, once again, I come back to the issue about um, subsidies and how they will help us to uh, promote the use of cleaner fuels like LPG. Um, indeed, the, when we, we talk about these things, sometimes the accessories and the fuels or the cleaner fuels that are needed to promote these clean, uh, clean cooking uh, practices, it's not as if they are not available. They are very much available. We all know there are several ways of achieving clean, clean cooking, but why are they not being used? It's because the end users, majority of them, cannot afford them. And so how do we make sure that once the products are available and accessible, they are also able to be encouraged to use them. And that's how come the issue about subsidies always keep, keep coming up. From where we sit, um, as uh, someone who has uh, this, uh, handled pricing of petroleum products for, over a long time, we know some of the challenges with subsidies. It, the challenges, one of the main challenges is that government always wants to subsidize and make uh, products free, or, um, free for consumers, but they don't have any sustainable means of funding these subsidies. And that is where the challenge is. But we have to look at the, the end goal. If really we want to promote clean cooking and uh, get people to be healthy, uh, healthy, then there's a price to pay. So we have to look, rather focus on the ways to make sure that these subsidies, if they are to be put in place, they can be well targeted. They can be um, sustainable in terms of funding so that we we'll achieve our goal. For example, in 2015, when Ghana implemented the price regulation policy where we scrapped subsidies on LPG, gasoline, and, uh, uh, sorry, and diesel, we still kept subsidies on products like premix fuel, which is used by fishermen. We know who the fishermen are. There are other challenges with these subsidies today, but we cannot overlook the benefits of subsidizing and making sure that the target group are getting these um, fuel. So the same with LPG, we are implementing the cylinder recirculation model, which is trying to get a penetration of LPG in Ghana from 25%, as we currently have it, to about 50% by 2030. The issue of subsidy and affordable fuel keeps coming up. So we may not um, subsidize LPG, but we have to find ways, we have to be deliberate about making sure that LPG is affordable for the consumer, and that's how come there are recommendations as to how to, we can scrap some of the subsidies and how we can also even uh, make some of the products cheaper to some consumers. So consumers in Accra or Kumasi may not need the subsidies, but we know that consumers in certain poorer parts of Ghana will need that, so we have to target them, have data, we, that's why we are promoting the use of the national ID card, for example, to collect data, and one of the key components of the cylinder recirculation model is that before a cylinder is given to you, we have data on you, we know where you, where, you, where you live, and we are going to use technology to track these cylinders and know your consumption. All of these are ways to address some of the challenges with just giving wholesale subsidies so that we can achieve our, our goal of increasing the penetration of LPG in Ghana. And I think the point you alluded to, I mean, the biggest problem with subsidies is they cost a lot of money, and the money has to come from somewhere. And yeah, I'm curious, again, your personal views, but also from the perspective of the, of the donor community, what, how should we be thinking about this? Yes, well, first of all, I'm delighted to hear that uh, I actually have a lot more in common with Mr. Abbas than <laughs> <laughs> was previously understood. So indeed, um, um, yes. From the uh, Energizing Development Program, uh, let's say for a decade, uh, or more, we, we have been emphasizing also, with, this was the thinking internationally, uh, on market-based solutions. Yeah? So the market will solve a number of problems in the, in, the, in the field of energy access, both on the electricity side and on the clean cooking side. And what we can see is that the, uh, the cost reduction of solar systems has been so drastic that uh, indeed a bigger share of the market has been achieved. Um, has been reached, but even there, there's a, uh, let's say, the, the baseline of the pyramid that we all know has not been achieved. And so, based on the work of Gogla and ESMAP, uh, the End User Subsidy Lab was established, where exchanges uh, were made about uh, the experiences and the knowledge that we know uh, are required for the energy access 
market to expand to those that are would otherwise be left behind. And so, um, uh, in that in that framework of mind, uh, we were asked at the end of program by the Dutch government to develop a component on demand side subsidies uh, in various markets. And so we've uh, reached out to the colleagues at uh, at ESMAP. Um, very nice collaboration, also with the idea that in the uh, medium term we can scale up uh, successful approaches. Um, worked with, uh, with CCA also on the thinking, how does the uh, logic of the uh, electricity access market relate to the clean cooking market and how is it different? Um, and how can we uh, share further these experiences and, and build it up uh, to, to build stronger markets? And I think um, in terms of subsidy, what we can all agree on is that indeed some forms of sub subsidies are needed. Uh, we have very nice experiences, for example, in Rwanda where we have been able to, to on the basis of income level category of the household, uh, target certain subsidies. Yes, this has implications for data, about the knowledge of, uh, let's say, data aggregation at a level uh, where you must be sure you can trust the parties um, that deal with your data, but the, the point is that you can, you can really move away from blanket subsidies and find your target groups and assign through mobile money, through e-vouchers, through various means, um, these, these consumer groups that, that you need to reach. And, uh, and I think that's, that's part of the, let's say, solution of our, our pro and con debate is, is uh, we have the tools, it appears, to, to solve this riddle, it will still cost a lot of money, but I've been told by somebody that I found very inspiring on day one that it's, it's much less than an, uh, an LPG term, uh, an LNG terminal. So um, yes, things cost money, good things in life cost money, and, uh, and I think uh, clean cooking for these target groups is, is indeed a good investment. And I think one thing that I haven't come out yet, heard come out yet, but I think is really important to keep in mind is that one way of thinking about it is that poorly defined property rights are a massive subsidy on LPG fuels, right? That, that, that we're not, this isn't an even playing ground, right? That, that there are these sort of tacit subsidies on, on, on biomass fuels. So Martin, you know, again, breaking, breaking the role, although I have, a, I have a hunch that you are maybe not role playing as much as some of the others. Um, but I'm curious your perspective as an entrepreneur, as, a, as somebody who is, you know, living and breathing uh, clean energy markets, sort of what, what, your, what your take is. Thank you. Uh, I think like I alluded earlier, and which is really the concern in the room, is how do we ensure that the actions that we are doing are going where they are needed, or they are benefiting the right people? And I think this is what we are talking about targeting. And like I said, today the tools are available. Jan mentioned about uh, using data. Today, in my country, in most countries, we have a lot of data even within the custody of governments. So what we are doing today uh, for us to grow uh, our business in a most effective way by benefiting those who deserve it is using this data to tell us where should we go, what categories of people should we target, which areas should we avoid and focus on and all that. So this we have used uh, religiously for the last uh, three years where we look at the demographics uh, and we target and focus to start with the most needy cases. Now, that helps us to see impact at the end of the day. The other issue is using technology helps us again, uh, and like my colleague Abbas mentioned, by being able to track daily usage. Today, from where I sit, I can be able to see the after effect of my customers. I can tell you how each and every household out of the 350,000 houses that, households that we serve today are consuming. And you can be able to see the trends and patterns. Those who are not consuming as anticipated, you still have a last chance to correct it. So using data, using technology, assist in ensuring there is maximum impact. There's something else that I must highlight that we have uh, come to appreciate as a business. One, um, it's, it's an issue of liquidity as opposed to really pricing. Today, for you to get into the clean cooking space, you need high upfront cost. Fair enough. 
that can be helped by one of subsidy. But on a day-to-day -day basis, these households are able to live on charcoal, which is not cheap. They are able to live on kerosene, which is not cheap. Our data has shown us that by enabling them through mobile uh, platform, mobile, mobile money transfer platforms and our smart meter technology, we are able to still maintain these households using less, much less than what they were using on a daily basis, but in this case to spend it on clean, cleaner fuels. So with all these tools being used uh, responsibly and effectively, I believe this is a space that all of us should be able to succeed in and cause great impact. Yeah. But a skeptic might say, you're, you're doing perfectly well without subsidies, so why would you need subsidies? When we talk about subsidy, it, it cuts across um, government uh, development partners, ETC. For instance, I still don't understand why most governments will talk about moving into clean cooking, for instance, and at the same time, continue taxing the same commodity to the consumer. So subsidies would take various shapes and forms. For in my case, we have the funds to help us uh, achieve the impact that we need, but we would be doing much better if we could bring our government on the table and tell them, for instance, you don't need to put VAT to the consumer, you don't need to tax the same commodity. So if some of these interventions are achieved, then obviously the impact would be much more because yeah. we are sort of double speaking, saying we want to uh, improve uh, on clean cooking penetration. But on the same side, we are coming in and taxing the same. While we are not taxing uh, fuel, I mean, uh, dirty fuels like charcoal and uh, all these other kind of things. So there, there are various forms of interventions that will be needed to accelerate the impact, in yeah. my view. So, you know, targeting has, has obviously been a, a, a central theme in, in how we're thinking about this. And, and I want to just push a little bit more on that, and, and, and in particular this question of, of, of who to target and, and the role of data in that. And, and I just want to put one, one additional idea on the table that, it, that I don't think has been mentioned yet, is that in addition to targeting based on income, which is I think what you're referring to, Martin, is the idea of, of targeting based on biological windows of susceptibility. So there may be some individuals at certain points in their life cycle, and I think specifically of pregnant women, for example, where, who are particularly vulnerable. The developing fetus might be particularly vulnerable to the harmful effects of, of biomass smoke. And so if you can find ways to to target uh, clean energy interventions to those, to those particular individuals, you might achieve an outsized health benefit relative to other forms of targeting that one might imagine. But I'm, I'm curious, Juliet, in, in your work at the bank, has, what, how has the bank thought about targeting? So targeting, like I said, it's a very important uh, issue. Apart from the fact that governments can pick and choose who they want to give their uh, stoves to, getting the right people, the people who really need the cook stoves, is important. I mean, in a place like Rwanda, because of their, I guess, their, uh, you know, they have their, uh, what's it called, the income categorizations, they are able to tell which class of people need the uh, product which class of, you know, would need the product for free or at a subsidized rate. But many of us or many of our countries don't have those kinds of classification. So it becomes really difficult. And one thing that I would say is that our use of the RBF instrument, RBF schemes, is a way that will help us classify or target the right people because with RBF, the uh, service provider is only reimbursed after they have you know, identified who that person is, who that individual who needs the cook stove is. They follow up, they make sure that they have the stove and the stove is being used before disbursement is made to them. So in that way, we know who is getting the uh, cook stoves and who, if, if that person is not the right person, they will not get reimbursed. So the RBF scheme can be tailored or engineered in such a way that the right uh, person or the right uh, community gets the, uh, the service or gets the cook stove. And Abbas, maybe you could mention a little bit about the history of the rural LPG program and how that might illustrate some of the, the risks of targeting 
you know, the people who can't afford the fuel. Do you want to talk a little bit about that story? Yes, and actually, um, the Ministry of uh, Ghana's government and the Ministry of Energy have been running the Rural LPG Promotion Program for some time now, and actually it's been um, scaled up, and now we have the LPG for Development Program. All of this is to ensure that we achieve our goal of um, promoting the use of LPG. But like I said earlier, it is not enough just giving them the cooking accessories and the cylinders, mm -hmm. and then they cannot, afford the, they cannot afford the products that they need to do the cooking, which is the LPG itself. And we've had examples where, where after the, the cylinders have been distributed to the poor, uh, the rural areas, they went back and they saw, I think Ian used that example in his uh, debate, we saw people had used the cylinders as benches, so playing cards and playing drafts. So they just put one cylinder here, another cylinder here, put a plank on it, and they are sitting on it. So that's what they use the cylinders for, all because they cannot afford the LPG. So it's something that we have to really look at and not just go and distribute the clean uh, the cylinders, the cook stoves, and leave it there. We have to make sure that we follow up and make sure they can assess the LPG. So I'm happy, for example, uh, Martin's company is using such examples. And we've had, as part of implementing the CRM, which I mentioned earlier, we've had companies come in to make such proposals that they can help the consumers to buy the LPG on a meter per meter basis so that instead of going to buy charcoal on a daily basis, they use the LPG on a, using the meter. Then it helps them to move away from um, the LPG, sorry, the non-clean cooking fuels, and then move to LPG, which is much cleaner. So that's some of the things that we've seen here in Ghana. Thank you. And I, I want to ask maybe one or two more questions, and then we'll, we'll open it to the audience. But I want to, to pose to, to Jan and Juliet the question of, of are subsidies most effective, um, or at what point in the, in the value chain are subsidies most effective? Is, it, is, is, is really the consumer the place to look? Or you, know, you mentioned the results-based financing model, which is typically upstream uh, at, the, at the distributor level, or perhaps even higher upstream. And I'm curious your thoughts on sort of where in the, in the value chain or the, the distribution chain is, is, is likely to be most effective. Yes, if I perhaps can, uh, colleague Juliet. Uh, respond to that part uh, indeed. Uh, so a lot of the results-based finance that uh, the en Energizing Development Program has, has implemented is on the supplier side and uh, it works very well and in many markets it's still necessary for certain categories of products. Uh, it's necessary to, to enable uh, suppliers, distributors to, to do what they do best is uh, make sure that these services are available. But then we see, as I mentioned, at the base of the pyramid, there's these consumers that will never, with the best w will in the world, will never be able to, to afford these, these products. And there uh, we also need uh, support on the demand side. And it must, in my view, it must go through the customers. The customer must make the decision to have this piece of equipment in her household. The, cu the customer must pay a price for this. It must not be zero. Uh, the, I think um, I'm a bit shocked hearing about uh, uh, advanced biomass sto stoves being, being distributed or dumped or whatever you call it in, in large uh, swaths of, of uh, African countries at the moment. Um, knowing from behavioral, knowing the human nature is that these, these things will not be valued as much as if people would have chosen to, let's say they buy it for one dollar or two dollars, but they have chosen to have this in their homes. It was not put in front of their door like an Amazon box and uh, see, you didn't order this, but uh, I'm sure you'll like it. It's red. Um, and so uh, I think this aspect, why is it related to subsidies? Because we can over subsidize. We have the power to do that. We do pilots. And uh, I think uh, where, uh, the, where the knowledge is needed is the fine line between where we are, let's say, pulling the market and where we are pushing the market too far, uh, where, where the price, the cost perception of the consumer is completely diluted and, and therefore also the usage pattern that will follow is not the one that we, we want. I'll leave it to that because I'm also very curious what are the thoughts in the, in the, in the audience. Joy, do you have any, 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 any thoughts on the question of where in the value chain? Well, uh, there has to be a product for, to be available. 
for somebody to use. So if we are subsidizing the end users, there should be a way to subsidize, uh, I mean, supply, the suppliers. And like I said, this is done through, could be done through RBF, it could be done through concessionary funding, financing to the uh, suppliers, because they also need to get the products available. Like Abbas was saying, the rural LPG promotion program failed because people got stoves, they got cylinders, but they weren't able to get a refilling point or you know, access to refill the cylinders, so the cylinders were just used. So under the uh, cylinder recirculation models, there are going to be community exchange points where, which will bring the uh, supply of the fuel closer to the rural areas. So those are some of the things that subsidies might be required. Subsidies to get these real fill outlets closer to the households. They need to be very safe. They are under the CRM, they are going to be uh, bottling plants. They are going to be uh, big trucks that will move the uh, cylinders to the rural areas. So I think in those areas that would bring the, uh, the, the fuel close to the household, we could get the subsidy to encourage those marketers to be able to supply the households with the needed uh, so I think I think this is an opportune moment to open it up, uh, open it up to questions from the audience. And why don't we start with uh, Josh Rosenthal from the NIH? Hi, thank you for this really stimulating discussion. Um, I have two kind of related questions. Just knowing how dynamic the world is, both the economics of this world. The technology change has happened, even just in the last three or four forums, how much these markets and the technology has changed. One, how do we calibrate subsidies uh, so that we don't crowd out innovation in the market? So if we're talking about, because LPG is on the table as a really important opportunity now, how do we make sure that we don't calibrate in such a way that it crowds out growth in solar, which in the long term may be a place we'd rather be? Related to that is, how do you wind down subsidies that have become entrenched in popular opinions? And maybe, Darby, you might want to share the Ecuador story in that regard. And we're, did you have, uh, and I should have noted, if, if you want to address the questions to the panel, that's fine. But if you had specific individuals in mind, I don't know, Josh, with the, with the, the crowding out question, did you have a particular panelist in mind? Would anybody care to speak to that? I would like to. Yes, please. Okay. So I have a contribution. For me, I believe that subsidy is possible and is needed to ensure people use clean fuel. We take the case of people who are into cocaine. To get somebody to, to get into addiction, they first of all give them for free. We take, they give you for free after some time. When you get addicted, they leave you. And then you are your own. And that's the time people start selling their property to get cocaine to use because they cannot do without cocaine. So for me, we can take learnings from the microfinance uh, model where they use cooperatives. So we can use a cooperative system in the community where individuals are held accountable to each other. So we give the subsidy or the fuel to the community or to the group of people, and then each of them within the group are held accountable to each other. In that case, it is much easier to track who is using what and who, where the explainers are going. But if you give it to an individual, of course, you find them using it as benches, or they'll keep the cylinder. A sister or a daughter from the city will come and say, oh, I have this thing. It takes it to the city because it's more expensive in the city than the rural area. So my proposal is that let's look at the cooperative model used by the, uh, the, the microfinance people to, to, to see how we can get subsidy to the rural targeted areas. Thank you very much. Well, let's, let's give a response to the earlier question as well, and then we'll, and then we'll continue. Uh, Abbas, I think you wanted to speak to the crowding out question. Yes. So um, first of all, in order not to crowd out innovation, we have to look at in Ghana, for example, I think you mentioned earlier, we have a full cost recovery of investment principle. So whatever, we have the full cost recovery of investment principle. So we have to first of all look at the cost of providing the, either the product or the service. Once we know that full cost, and if government is to subsidize, 
we have to make sure that there's a sustainable way of making sure whoever has invested, the subsidy is paid to the investor. Um, the challenge we have with subsidies, as everybody is saying, has been saying we are subsidizing but not uh, refunding those subsidies. What eventually happens is that the product becomes unavailable because um, subsidizing and not paying affects supply. So in order not to crowd out um, the uh, innovation, we have to determine what kind of innovation we need and ensure that the investors are putting that in place and it's added up to their cost of providing the, the product. And then if you decide to subsidize, make sure there's a sustainable way of funding that subsidy. I think uh, maybe there will be an opportunity to make suggestions as to how to um, fund some of these subsidies. But uh, let me just mention one of them. Cross-subsidization is one. We can cross-subsidize uh, the product uh, using one product, for example, to pay for the subsidy on another product, rather than relying on government to budget and go and find money from somewhere else to come and pay for these subsidies. In that way, we can sustain the subsidies. And then just briefly to Josh's point about, about the situation in Ecuador. So Ecuador is now working very hard to try to replace the reliance on LPG with, with uh, induction electric cooking. They have abundant cheap hydro. And it's been extremely challenging, and in part because the LPG is so cheap. And, and I think, you know, I think this is a, a central challenge. I mean, I think that, you know, I think, the, you know, you can sort of turn it around and think it's a, take it as a design principle. And I think that was some of the points that Abbas was making, is if you, if you sort of design, design things ex ante, anticipating those problems, then maybe, maybe, maybe you can have an intelligent response. So I saw there was a couple of hands up. Yes, please. Um, I have a question. Maybe Martin, you are able to answer, or somebody in the audience. I'm really curious to see what is the point of view of an equity investor, right? Uh, if I'm an equity investor, I would have very mixed feelings about subsidies because I want to invest in a sustainable business model that doesn't depend on subsidies because we hear the subsidies come and go. You have no certainty about when you get paid. It may last one year, it may last 10, it may last six months. So, Martin, do you know what the equity investor's view on subsidies is? And I think this is very relevant for all of us here. And if there's any, to, any equity investor in the room that has a view on subsidies, I would love to hear. I know that the lenders will love it, right? Because there is some cash flow that is coming to the business, indirectly or directly, right? But the equity investor, Martin. Maybe just to quickly comment on that. I think from um, a point of equity investment, I think what you would be asking to see is the viability of the project because at that point you look at it as a business. So regardless of the capital outlay that is required uh, from us as the owners of business to run these programs, as an equity partner, you will be looking at the viability. And the viability, again, like I said earlier, will depend on a couple of things. The kit you are giving out there, and the uptake of your LPG sales, how then do you see the repayment and the sustainability? And what I can tell you is, if this venture is run carefully, then it's a question of time. It's a question of when do I need my return. So by establishing those facts, it becomes quite easy. Looking at the books, looking at the returns, looking at the consistency of the um, of, uh, uptake from the consumers, this then gives you the right uh, tools to make a decision. Something I may want to add that helps a lot in the success of this venture and the subsidies as well is consumer education. I, I think this is something that is always ignored either by government or by, by private uh, uh, financiers going into this business. They assume that the consumers know how to use cleaner uh, fuels and accessories. From experience, we've come to rank consumer education very highly. And today, I have invested significantly in trainers, in employees. I think the bulk of my, my overheads today go to employees. I have, for instance, today almost 2,000 employees. And most of these are being used as uh, food soldiers or what you would call salespeople. But the bulk of our sales uh, approach and pitch is consumer education. For instance, our strategy is not to let the consumer come to us. Our strategy is to go to the consumer. And then we go through a process of vetting, education, before we take a decision whether that is the right consumer to onboard. So with all these carefully thought out strategies, then viability can be established, equity partnership then follows. And I, I think it's also worth <laughs> noting that you know, nobody expects the clean energy transition to happen in rich economies without subsidies, right? So why should we expect it in poor countries? I would love to touch 
Yeah. Please. So, um, the question about how the equity, the view of the equity investor on these subsidies. Let me say that um, we, we used to have this challenge in Ghana some years back when we had subsidies, um, when we did not have a sustainable way of funding these subsidies. So, when we scrapped subsidies and we kept subsidies on Premix 4, which I use as an example, the government introduced a levy called the Price Stabilization Recovery Levy. And this levy, the purpose is to fund the subsidies we have on Premix 4. So now there's assurance to the investor that there's a source of funding for your subsidies. So unlike previously where it could take over a year and government had not paid the subsidies to the investors, the businessmen, now there's consistency in how often government pays the subsidies because there's a source of fund. So if such measures are put in place to ensure that there's a sustainable way of funding these investments, then these subsidies, then the equity investor will be very assured and will go into investment. I think there was a question in the front here. Uh, I'm sorry. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Bayo. Uh, you are talking about subsidy. Whether subsidy or not subsidy, it's about education. If you say you want to go to the villages and you don't educate them, they are just there. You just go and dump the thing to them. How are they going to use it? I'm from the northern part of Ghana, from Upper West. I, I want to do biofuel there, using uh, water hyson. Before uh, I want to take the project, just recently I went there. I went to the women. I took a stove and I said, if you use this, it's very good. I educated them on how to use it. And I, I haven't even started it. They are calling me, oh, madam, when are you bringing it? When are you bringing it? It's about education, but whether you say, let's look, take our cell phone for a, a, example. The phones that we are using. If you go to the villages, they are even using the most costly phones than we in the cities. Let's look, look at this forum, clean cooking forum. Everything is based in Accra. Everything is based in Accra. And part of the villages, even if this forum had, I know they, they organized first one in Accra. If this forum were to be organized in Tamil, somebody going around, they will ask, ah, but what are they doing? What are they and looking at this? We are educating them. So it's not just about subsidy or not subsidy. Whether subsidy or not subsidy, if the people are being educated, and they know the health wise and know the benefits. I think the people who use it, whether subsidy or no subsidy, and I, I'm, I, I, I'm also pleading with them, next time, let us also move our meetings to a nearer, maybe, city. So That's that great. I, I think. A the next one in Tamil is a fantastic idea. I, I see, I see Colm is taking notes. <laughs> let's turn, I'm, I'm sorry, Madame, but I, let's, give, let's give the voice to the next person, please. Uh, the gentleman in the front, please. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I would like to thank you. Uh, uh, way of presenting this discussions, I realize that it is totally different that we uh, seen other, other uh, cases. I would like to contribute on this discussion that we have to think the, the, the two terminologies, uh, subsidy and uh, redistribution. The, these two, uh, two words we cannot put in the single basket. They are totally mutually ex exclusive terms. So if any government wants to give um, uh, their citizen uh, free, uh, freely any product, it is up to the government. We have not to discuss on that. So we should focus on, on the subsidies. What, what is it, it, it for? I think the providing subsidies, uh, uh, there is two objectives. First one is the, to make the, uh, the people, um, uh, to make the, like an appetizer. We, we cannot give the subsidy uh, um, uh, more than 50% or like that. It should be the minimum, uh, minimal, uh, minimal level of the uh, amount that's, that uh, stimulates the users to uh, purchase the, the technology. Uh, that is the one objective. Another is that we are uh, mostly we are from the developing countries. 
that most of the people, people's willingness to, uh, the affordability level is uh, poor. So we have to give um, uh, focus, we have to focus on how to uh, increase their affordability. So it is one of the objectives that provide, pro providing subsidy by either, either the users or the uh, suppliers. Uh, the affordability level will be increased. Uh, other way is that uh, uh, the, uh, how to say, uh, we need a, we, by the awareness uh, activities, we can uh, uh, convince the users that what is the uh, opportunity cost of um, using uh, traditional fuel, in, 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 instead of traditional fuel, using clean fuels, the, we can convince them uh, so that their uh, willingness to pay can be increased. The, their, their ability to pay remains the same, but we can increase their willingness to pay. So, and I'm so sorry, sir, but I'm, Colm is signaling that we're at the end of our time, so, so I'm going to I'm gonna have to transition to, so people can get to the next, uh, okay, okay, the next event. But I'm sure several of us will be lingering if, if, if others have questions or, so, or comments at, that they at want last, to share. I, I would like yeah. to conclude that we need the subsidy uh, for the developing countries to uh, promote the clean cooking solution. So it should be uh, not treated like a free distribution and uh, subsidy part. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, panelists, my name is Godfrey. I'm an engineer with the United Nations in Kenya, and I very much resonate with what uh, Martin was sharing. One of the key areas which I think as uh, development agencies that are gathered here, and also government agencies, one of the areas to focus on is taxes. Because as some of the places where we work with, like uh, for instance, you know Kenya has got some of the largest refugee camps in the world, and as these refugee camps uh, being located in very semi-arid, fragile ecosystems, you find the access to fuel, the very basic thing for cooking, access to fuel has been a big problem. A challenge which I faced is, the, in, among these communities, there are very innovative ideas of uh, coming up with their own equipment to assemble these cook stoves, clean cook stoves, but then, the import duties are very high. The import cost is so huge. I think we need to accelerate that part of lobbying the government to waive some of these uh, customs duties and taxes because that is one key area. If we are to focus on subsidies, which will level the playground for everyone, taxes is uh, the, the, the starting point, according to me. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. And, and thank you very much for your participation. So a round of applause for the wonderful panelists, please. Thank you. Just a quick announcement. The next session will be starting in here at 3, uh, three o'clock. So we have just a quick 10-minute break. Thank you. request for a photo. <laughs> I don't think I